The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett To Sir Watkin Phillips, Bart, of Jesus College, Oxon. Dear Phillips, if I stay much longer at Edinburgh, I shall be changed into a downright Caledonian, my uncle observes, that I have already acquired something of the country accent. The people here are so social and attentive in their civilities to strangers, that I am insensibly sucked into the channel of their manners and customs, although they, are in fact much more different from ours than you can imagine, that difference, however, which struck me very much at my first arrival, I now hardly perceive, and my ear is perfectly reconciled to the Scotch accent, which I find even agreeable in the mouth of a pretty woman, it is a sort of Doric dialect which gives an idea of amiable simplicity, you cannot imagine how we have been caressed and feasted in the good town of Edinburgh of which we are become free denizens and guild brothers, by the special favour of the magistracy. I had a whimsical commission from Bath, to a citizen of this metropolis. Quinn, understanding our intention to visit Edinburgh, pulled out a guinea, and desired the favour I would drink it at a tavern with a particular friend and bottle companion of his, Mr. R. C., a lawyer of this city, I charged myself with the commission, and, taking the guinea, you see, said I, I have pocketed your bounty. Yes, replied Quinn, laughing, and a headache into the bargain, if you drink fair. I made use of this introduction to Mr. C., who received me with open arms, and gave me the rendezvous, according to the cartel. He had provided a company of jolly fellows, among whom I, found myself extremely happy, and did Mr. C., and Quinn all the justice in my power, but, alas, I was no more than a tyro among a troop of veterans, who had compassion upon my youth and conveyed me home in the morning by what means I know not, Quinn was mistaken, however, as to the headache, the claret was too good to treat me so roughly. While Mr. Bramble holds conferences with the graver literati of, the place, and our females are entertained at visits by the Scotch ladies, who are the best and kindest creatures upon earth, I pass my time among the bucks of Edinburgh, who, with a great share of spirit and vivacity, have a certain shrewdness and self-command that is not often found among their neighbours, in the high day of youth and exultation, not a hint escapes a Scotchman that can be interpreted into offence by any individual in the company, and national reflections are never heard, in this particular, I must own, we are both unjust and ungrateful to the Scots, for, as far as I am able to judge, they have a real esteem for the natives of South Britain, and never mention our country, but with expressions of regard, nevertheless, they are far from being servile imitators of our modes and fashionable vices. All their customs and regulations of public and private economy, of business and diversion, are in their own style. This remarkably predominates in their looks, their dress and manner, their music, and even their cookery. Our squire declares, that he knows not another people upon earth, so strongly marked with a national character, now we are upon the article of, cookery, I must own, some of their dishes are savoury, and even delicate but I am not yet Scotchman enough to relish their singed sheep's head and haggis, which were provided at our request, one day at Mr. Mitchelson's, where we dined, the first put me in mind of the history of Congo, in which I had read of Negroes' heads sold publicly in the markets, the last, being a mess of minced lights, livers, suet, oatmeal, onions, and pepper, enclosed in a sheep's stomach, had a very sudden effect upon mine, and the delicate Mrs. Tabby changed colour, when the cause of our disgust was instantaneously removed at the nod of our entertainer. The Scots, in general, are attached to this composition, with a sort of national fondness, as well as to their oatmeal bread, which is presented at every table, in thin triangular cakes, baked upon a plate of iron, called a girdle, and these, many of the natives, even in the higher ranks of life, prefer to wheat and bread which they have here in perfection, you know we used to vex poor Murray of Balliol College, by asking, if there was really no fruit but turnips in Scotland question mark sure enough, I have seen turnips make their appearance, not as a desert, but, by way of hors d'oeuvres, or wets, 
as radishes are served betwixt more substantial dishes in France and Italy, but it must be observed, that the turnips of this country are as much superior in sweetness, delicacy, and flavor, to those in England, as a musk melon is to the stock of a common cabbage. They are small and conical, of a yellowish color, with a very thin skin and, over and above their, agreeable taste, are valuable for their antiscorbutic quality as to the fruit now in season, such as cherries, gooseberries, and currants, there is no want of them at Edinburgh, and in the gardens of some gentlemen, who live in the neighborhood, there is now a very favorable appearance of apricots, peaches, nectarines, and even grapes, nay, I have seen a very fine show of pineapples within a few miles of this metropolis. Indeed, we have no reason to be surprised at these particulars, when we consider how little difference there is, in fact, betwixt this climate and that of London. All the remarkable places in the city and its avenues, for ten miles around, we have visited, much to our satisfaction. In the castle are some royal apartments, where the sovereign occasionally resided, and, here are carefully preserved the regalia of the kingdom, consisting of a crown, said to be of great value, a scepter, and a sort of state, adorned with jewels, of these symbols of sovereignty, the people are exceedingly jealous, a report being spread during the sitting of the Union Parliament, that they were removed to London, such a tumult arose, that the Lord Commissioner would have been torn to, pieces, if he had not produced them for the satisfaction of the populace. The Palace of Holyrood House is an elegant piece of architecture, but sunk in an obscure, and, as I take it, unwholesome bottom, where one would imagine it had been placed on purpose to be concealed. The apartments are lofty, but unfurnished, and as for the pictures of the Scottish kings, from Fergus I. to King William, they, are paltry daubings, mostly by the same hand, painted either from the imagination, or porters hired to sit for the purpose. All the diversions of London we enjoy at Edinburgh, in a small compass. Here is a well-conducted concert, in which several gentlemen perform on different instruments, the Scots are all musicians, every man you meet plays on the flute, the violin, or violoncello, and there is, one nobleman, whose compositions are universally admired, our company of actors is very tolerable, and a subscription is now on foot for building a new theatre, but their assemblies please me above all other public exhibitions. We have been at the Hunter's Ball, where I was really astonished to see such a number of fine women, the English, who have never crossed the Tweed, imagine erroneously, that, the Scotch ladies are not remarkable for personal attractions, but, I can declare with a safe conscience, I never saw so many handsome females together, as were assembled on this occasion. At the Leith races, the best company comes hither from the remoter provinces, so that, I suppose, we had all the beauty of the kingdom concentrated as it were into one focus, which was, indeed, so vehement, that, my heart could hardly resist its power. Between friends, it has sustained some damage from the bright eyes of the charming Miss R. and O. N., whom I had the honor to dance with at the ball, the Countess of Melville attracted all eyes, and the admiration of all present she was accompanied by the agreeable Miss Grieve, who made many conquests, nor did my sister Liddy pass unnoticed in the assembly, she, is become a toast at Edinburgh, by the name of the fair Cambrian, and has already been the occasion of much wine shed, but the poor girl met with an accident at the ball, which has given us great disturbance. A young gentleman, the express image of that rascal Wilson, went up to ask her to dance a minuet, and his sudden appearance shocked her so much, that she fainted away, I call Wilson a rascal, because, if he had been really a gentleman, with honorable intentions, he would have, ere now, appeared in his own character, I must own, my blood boils with indignation when I think of that fellow's presumption, and heaven confound me if I don't, but I won't be so womanish as to rail, time will, perhaps, furnish occasion, thank God, the cause of Liddy's disorder remains a secret. The lady directress, of the ball, thinking she was overcome by the heat of the place, had her conveyed to another room, where she soon recovered so well, as to return and join in the country dances, 
in which the Scotch lasses acquit themselves with such spirit and agility, as put their partners to the height of their mettle. I believe our aunt, Mrs. Tabitha, had entertained hopes of being able to do some execution, among the cavaliers at this assembly, she had been several days in consultation with milliners and mancha makers, preparing for the occasion, at which she made her appearance in a full suit of damask, so thick and heavy, that the sight of it alone, at this season of the year, was sufficient to draw drops of sweat from many man of ordinary imagination, she danced one minuet with our friend Mr. Mitchelson, who favoured her so far, in the spirit of hospitality and politeness, and she was called out a second time by the young laird of Ballet Mahapal, who, coming in by accident, could not readily find any other partner, but as the first was a married man, and the second paid no particular homage to her charms, which were also overlooked by the rest of the company, she became dissatisfied and censorious, at supper, she observed that, the Scotch gentlemen made a very good figure, when they were a little improved by travelling, and therefore it was pity they did not all take the benefit of going abroad. She said the women were awkward, masculine creatures, that, in dancing, they lifted their legs like so many colts, that they had no idea of graceful motion, and put on their clothes in a frightful manner, but if the truth must be, told, Tabby herself was the most ridiculous figure, and the worst dressed of the whole assembly. The neglect of the male sex rendered her malcontent and peevish, she now found fault with everything at Edinburgh, and tized her brother to leave the place, when she was suddenly reconciled to it on a religious consideration, there is a sect of fanatics, who have separated themselves from the, established Kirk, under the name of seceders, they acknowledge no earthly head of the church, reject lay patronage, and maintain the Methodist doctrines of the new birth, the new light, the efficacy of grace, the insufficiency of works, and the operations of the Spirit. Mrs. Tabitha, attended by Humphrey Clinker, was introduced to one of their conventicles, where they both received much edification, and she has had the good fortune to come acquainted with a pious Christian, called Mr. Moffat, who is very powerful in prayer, and often assists her in private exercises of devotion. I never saw such a concourse of genteel company at any races in England, as appeared on the course of Leith, hard by, in the fields called the Lynx, the citizens of Edinburgh divert themselves at a game called golf, in, which they use a curious kind of bats, tipped with horn, and small elastic balls of leather, stuffed with feathers, rather less than tennis balls, but of a much harder consistence, this they strike with such force and dexterity from one hole to another, that they will fly to an incredible distance. Of this diversion the Scots are so fond, that when the weather will permit, you may see a multitude of, all ranks, from the senator of justice to the lowest tradesman, mingled together in their shirts, and following the balls with the utmost eagerness. Among others, I was shown one particular set of golfers, the youngest of whom was turned of fourscore, they were all gentlemen of independent fortunes, who had amused themselves with this pastime for the best part of a century, without having ever felt, the least alarm from sickness or disgust, and they never went to bed, without having each the best part of a gallon of claret in his belly. Such uninterrupted exercise, cooperating with the keen air from the sea, must, without all doubt, keep the appetite always on edge, and steal the constitution against all the common attacks of distemper. The Leith races gave occasion to another entertainment, of a very singular nature, there is at Edinburgh a society or corporation of errant boys, called Caudes, who ply in the streets at night with paper lanthorns, and are very serviceable in carrying messages, these fellows, though shabby in their appearance, and rudely familiar in their address are wonderfully acute, and so noted for fidelity, that there is no instance of, a, Caudy's having betrayed, his trust, such is their intelligence, that they know, not only every individual of the place, but also every stranger, by that time he has been four and twenty hours in Edinburgh, and no transaction, even the most private, can escape their notice. They are particularly famous for their dexterity in executing one of the functions of Mercury, though, for my own part, I never employed them in this, department of business, 
had I occasion for any service of this nature, my own man, Archie Mopine, is as well qualified as Ericotti in Edinburgh, and I am much mistaken, if he has not been heretofore of their fraternity. Be that as it may, they resolved to give a dinner and a ball at Leith, to which they formally invited all the young noblemen and gentlemen that were at the races, and this, invitation was reinforced by an assurance that all the celebrated ladies of pleasure would grace the entertainment with their company. I received a card on this occasion, and went thither with half a dozen of my acquaintance. In a large hall the cloth was laid on a long range of tables joined together, and here the company seated themselves, to the number of about fourscore, lords, and lairds, and, other gentlemen, courtesans and caudies mingled together as the slaves and their masters were in the time of the Saturnalia in ancient Rome. The toastmaster, who sat at the upper end, was one Caudi Fraser, a veteran pimp, distinguished for his humor and sagacity, well known and much respected in his profession by all the guests, male and female, that were here assembled. He had bespoke the dinner and the wine, he had taken care that all his brethren should appear in decent apparel and clean linen, and he himself wore a pair of wig with three tails in honor of the festival. I assure you the banquet was both elegant and plentiful, and seasoned with a thousand sallies, that promoted a general spirit of mirth and good humor. After the desert, Mr. Fraser proposed the following toasts, which I don't pretend to explain. The best in Christendom. Gibbs contract. The beggars Benison, Comma King and Kirk. Great Britain and Ireland. Then, filling a bumper, and turning to me, Mr. Malford, said he, may a unkindness cease betwixt John Bull and his sister Moggy. The next person he singled out, was a nobleman who had been long abroad. Ma Lord, cried Fraser, here is a bumper, to a those noblemen who have virtue enough to spend their rents in their ain cow and trade. He afterwards addressed himself to a member of Parliament in these words colon Meester, I'm sure ye'll ha na objection to my drinking disgrace and duel to Ilka Scott, that sells his conscience and his vote. He discharged a third sarcasm at a person very gaily dressed, who had risen from small beginnings, and, made a considerable fortune at play, filling his glass, and calling him by name, Lang Life, said he, to the wily loon that gangs a field with a two umpoke at his lunzy, and comes home with a sackful of siller. All these toasts being received with loud bursts of applause. Mr. Fraser called for pint glasses, and filled his own to the brim, then standing up, and all his brethren following his example, mullords and gentlemen, cried he, here is a cup of thanks for the great and undeserved honor you have done your poor errand boys this day. So saying, he and they drank off their glasses in a trice, and quitting their seats, took their station each behind one of the other guests, exclaiming, Knew were your honors caudies again. The nobleman who had bore the first brunt of Mr. Fraser's satire, objected to his abdication. He said, as the company was assembled by invitation from the Caudies, he expected they were to be entertained at their expense. By no means, my lord, cried Fraser, I wad na he guilty of sick presumption for the wide world, I never affronted a gentleman since I was born, and sure at this age I wad not offer an indignity to sick an honorable convention. Well, said his lordship, as you have expended some wit, you have a right to save your money. You have given me good counsel, and I take it in good part. As you have voluntarily quitted your seat, I will take your place with the leave of the good company, and think myself happy to be hailed, father of the feast. He was forthwith elected into the chair, and complimented in a bumper in his new character. The claret continued to circulate without interruption till the glasses seemed to dance upon the table, and this, perhaps, was a hint to the ladies to call for music, at eight in the evening the ball began in another apartment, at midnight we went to supper, but it was broad day before I found the way to my lodgings, and, no doubt, his lordship had a swinging bill to discharge. In, short, I have lived so riotously for some weeks, that my uncle begins to be alarmed on the score of my constitution and very seriously observes, that all his own infirmities are owing to such excesses indulged in his youth, Mrs. Tabitha says it would be more to the advantage of my soul as well as body, if, 
Instead of frequenting these scenes of debauchery, I would accompany Mr. Moffat and her to hear a sermon of the Reverend Mr. M. Apostrophe Corkendale. Clinker often exhorts me, with a groan, to take care of my precious health, and even Archie Mulpine, when he happens to be overtaken, which is oftener the case than I could wish, reads me a long lecture upon temperance and sobriety, and is so very wise and sententious, that, if I could provide him with a professor's chair, I would willingly give up the benefit of his ammonitions and service together, for I was tutor sick at alma mater. I am not, however, so much engrossed by the gaieties of Edinburgh, but that I find time to make parties in the family way, we have not only seen all the villas and villages within ten miles of the capital, but we have also crossed the Firth, which is an arm of the sea seven miles broad, that divides Lothian from the Shire, or, as the Scots call it, the Kingdom of Fife. There is a number of large open sea boats that ply on this passage from Leith to Kinghorn, which is a borough on the other side. In one of these our whole family embarked three days ago, excepting my sister, who, being exceedingly fearful of the water, was left to the care of Mrs. Mitchelson. We had an easy and quick passage into Fife, where we visited a number of poor towns on the seaside, including St. Andrews, which is the skeleton of a venerable city but we were much better pleased with some noble and elegant seats and castles, of which, there is a great number in that part of Scotland. Yesterday we took boat again on our return to Leith, with fair wind and agreeable weather, but we had not advanced halfway when the sky was suddenly overcast, and the wind changing, blew directly in our teeth so that we were obliged to turn, or tack the rest of the way. In a word, the gale increased to a storm of wind and rain attended with such a fog, that we could not see the town of Leith, to which we were bound, nor even the castle of Edinburgh, notwithstanding its high situation. It is not to be doubted but that we were all alarmed on this occasion. And at the same time, most of the passengers were seized with a nausea that produced violent retchings. My aunt desired her brother to order the boatman, to put back to Kinghorn, and this, expedient he actually proposed but they assured him there was no danger. Mrs. Tabitha finding them obstinate, began to scold, and insisted upon my uncle's exerting his authority as a justice of the peace. Sick and peevish as he was called, he could not help laughing at this wise proposal, telling her, that his commission did not extend so far, and, if it did, he should let the people take their own way, for he thought it would be great presumption in him to direct them in the exercise of their own profession. Mrs. Winifred Jenkins made a general clearance with the assistance of Mr. Humphrey Clinker, who joined her both in prayer and ejaculation. As he took it for granted that we should not be long in this world, he offered some spiritual consolation to Mrs. Tabitha, who rejected it with great disgust, bidding him keep his sermons for those who had leisure to hear such nonsense. My uncle sat, collected in himself, without speaking. My man Archie had recourse to a brandy bottle, with which he made so free, that I imagined he had sworn to die of drinking anything rather than seawater, but the brandy had no more effect upon him in the way of intoxication, than if it had been seawater in, good earnest. As for myself, I was too much engrossed by the sickness at my stomach, to think of anything else. Meanwhile the sea swelled mountains high, the boat pitched with such violence, as if it had been going to pieces, the cordage rattled, the wind roared, the lightning flashed, the thunder bellowed, and the rain descended in a deluge, every time the vessel was put about, we shipped a sea, that drenched us all to the skin. When, by dint of turning, we thought to have cleared the pierhead, we were driven to leeward, and then the boatmen themselves began to fear that the tide would fail before we should fetch up our leeway, the next trip, however, brought us into smooth water, and we were safely landed on the quay, about one o'clock in the afternoon. To be sure, cried Dabby, when, she found herself on terra firma, we must all have perished, if we had not been the particular care of Providence. Yes, replied my uncle, but I am much of the honest Highlander's mind, after he had made such a passage as this, his friend told him he was much indebted to Providence, certainly said Donald, but, by my soul, moan, snare trouble providence again, 
so long as the brig of Stirling stands. Apostrophe you must know the brig, or bridge of Stirling, stands above 20 miles up the river forth, of which this is the outlet, I don't find that our squire has suffered in his health from this adventure, but poor Liddy is in a peaking way, I'm afraid this unfortunate girl is uneasy in her mind, and this apprehension distracts me, for she is really an amiable creature. We shall set out, tomorrow or next day for Stirling and Glasgow, and we propose to penetrate a little way into the highlands, before we turn our course to the southward, in the meantime, commend me to all our friends round Carfax, and believe me to be, ever yours, Edinburgh, August. To Dr. Lewis. I should be very ungrateful, dear Lewis, if I did not find myself disposed to think and speak favorably of this people, among whom I have met with more kindness, hospitality, and rational entertainment, in a few weeks, than ever I received in any other country during the whole course of my life. Perhaps, the gratitude excited by these benefits may interfere with the impartiality of my remarks for a man is as apt to be prepossessed by particular favors as to be prejudiced by private motives of disgust. If I am partial, there is, at least, some merit in my conversion from the liberal prejudices which had grown up with my constitution. The first impressions which an Englishman receives in this country, will not contribute to the removal of his prejudices, because he refers, everything he sees to a comparison with the same articles in his own country and this comparison is unfavorable to Scotland in all its exteriors, such as the face of the country in respect to cultivation, the appearance of the bulk of the people, and the language of conversation in general. I am not so far convinced by Mr. Lismahago's arguments, but that I think the Scots would do well, for, their own sakes, to adopt the English idioms and pronunciation, those of them especially, who are resolved to push their fortunes in South Britain. I know, by experience, how easily an Englishman is influenced by the ear, and how apt he is to laugh, when he hears his own language spoken with a foreign or provincial accent, I have known a member of the House of Commons speak with great energy and, precision, without being able to engage attention, because his observations were made in the Scotch dialect, which, no offence to Lieutenant Liz Mahago, certainly gives a clownish air even to sentiments of the greatest dignity and decorum. I have declared my opinion on this head to some of the most sensible men of this country, observing, at the same time, that if they would employ a few natives, of England to teach the pronunciation of our vernacular tongue, in twenty years there would be no difference, in point of dialect, between the youth of Edinburgh and of London. The civil regulations of this kingdom and metropolis are taken from very different models from those of England, except in a few particular establishments, the necessary consequences of the union. Their College of Justice is a bench of great dignity, filled with judges of character and ability. I have heard some causes tried before this venerable tribunal, and was very much pleased with the pleadings of their advocates, who are by no means deficient either in argument or elocution. The Scottish legislation is founded, in a great measure, on the civil law, consequently, their proceedings vary from those of the English tribunals, but, I think, they have the advantage of us in their method of examining witnesses apart, and in the constitution of their jury, by which they certainly avoid the evil which I mentioned in my last from Lismahago's observation. The University of Edinburgh is supplied with excellent professors in all the sciences, and the medical school, in particular, is famous all over, Europe. The students of this art have the best opportunity of learning it to perfection, in all its branches, as there are different courses for the theory of medicine and the practice of medicine, for anatomy, chemistry, botany, and the materia medica, over and above those of mathematics and experimental philosophy, and all these are given by men of distinguished talents. What renders this part? of education still more complete, is the advantage of attending the infirmary, which is the best instituted charitable foundation that I ever knew. Now we are talking of charities, here are several hospitals, exceedingly well endowed, and maintained under admirable regulations, and these are not only useful, 
but ornamental to the city. Among these, I shall only mention the general workhouse, in which all the poor, not otherwise provided for, are employed, according to their different abilities, with such judgment and effect, that they nearly maintain themselves by their labor, and there is not a beggar to be seen within the precincts of this metropolis. It was Glasgow that set the example of this establishment, about thirty years ago. Even the Kirk of Scotland, so long reproached with fanaticism and canting, abounds at present with ministers celebrated for their learning, and respectable for their moderation. I have heard their sermons with equal astonishment and pleasure. The good people of Edinburgh no longer think dirt and cobwebs essential to the house of God. Some of their churches have admitted such ornaments as would have excited sedition, even in England, a little more than a century ago, and psalmody is here practiced and taught by a professor from the Cathedral of Durham. I should not be surprised, in a few years, to hear it accompanied with an organ. Edinburgh is a hotbed of genius. I have had the good fortune to be made acquainted with many authors of the first distinction, such as the two Humes, Robertson, Smith, Wallace, Blair, Ferguson, Wilkie, and C. And I have found them all as agreeable in conversation as they are instructive and entertaining in their writings. These acquaintances I owe to the friendship of Dr. Carlyle who wants nothing but inclination to figure with the rest upon paper. The magistracy of Edinburgh is changed every year by election, and seems to be very well adapted both for state and authority. The Lord Provost is equal in dignity to the Lord Mayor of London, and the four baileys are equivalent to the rank of alderman. There is a dean of guild, who takes cognizance of mercantile affairs, a treasurer, a town clerk, and the council is composed of deacons one of whom is returned every year, in rotation, as representative of every company of artificers or handicraftsmen. Though this city, from the nature of its, situation, can never be made either very convenient or very cleanly, it has, nevertheless, an air of magnificence that commands respect. The castle is an instance of the sublime in sight and architecture. Its fortifications are kept in good order and there is always in it a garrison of regular soldiers, which is relieved every year, but it is incapable of sustaining a siege carried on according, to the modern operations of war. The castle hill, which extends from the outward gate to the upper end of the high street, is used as a public walk for the citizens, and commands a prospect, equally extensive and delightful, over the county of Fife, on the other side of the Frith, and all along the sea coast which is covered with a succession of towns that would seem to indicate a considerable share of commerce, but, if the truth must be told, these towns have been falling to decay ever since the Union, by which the Scots were in a great measure deprived of their trade with France. The palace of Holyrood House is a jewel in architecture, thrust into a hollow where it cannot be seen, a situation which was certainly not chosen by the ingenious architect who must have been confined to the side of the old palace, which was a convent. Edinburgh is considerably extended on the south side, where there are divers little elegant squares built in the English manner, and the citizens have planned some improvements on the north, which, when put in execution, will add greatly to the beauty and convenience of this capital. The seaport is Leith, a flourishing town, about a mile from the city in the harbour of which I have seen above one hundred ships lying all together. You must know, I had the curiosity to cross the Frith in a passage boat, and stayed two days in Fife, which is remarkably fruitful in corn, and exhibits a surprising number of fine seats, elegantly built, and magnificently furnished. There is an incredible number of noble houses in every part of Scotland that I have seen, Dalkeith, Pinky, Yester, and Lord Hopton's, Hope Towns, all of them within four or five miles of Edinburgh, are princely palaces, in every one of which a sovereign might reside at his case. I suppose the Scots affect these monuments of grandeur. If I may be allowed to mingle censure with my remarks upon a people I revere, I must observe, that their weak side seems to be vanity. I am, afraid that even their hospitality is not quite free of ostentation. I think I have discovered among them uncommon pains taken to display their fine linen, of which, indeed, they have great plenty, 
their furniture, plate, housekeeping, and variety of wines, in which article, it must be owned, they are profuse, if not prodigal, a burgher of Edinburgh, not content to vie with a citizen of London, who, has ten times his fortune, must excel him in the expense as well as elegance of his entertainments. Though the villas of the Scotch nobility and gentry have generally an air of grandeur and state, I think their gardens and parks are not comparable to those of England, a circumstance the more remarkable, as I was told by the ingenious Mr. Philip Miller of Chelsea, that almost all the gardeners of South Britain were natives of Scotland. The verdure of this country is not equal to that of England. The pleasure grounds are, in my opinion, not so well laid out according to the genius loci, nor are the lawns, and walks, and hedges kept in such delicate order. The trees are planted in prudish rows, which have not such an agreeable natural effect, as when they are thrown into irregular groups, with intervening glades, and firs, which they generally raise around their houses look dull and funereal in the summer season. I must confess, indeed, that they yield serviceable timber, and good shelter against the northern blasts, that they grow and thrive in the most barren soil, and continually perspire a fine balsam of turpentine, which must render the air very salutary and sanative to lungs, of a tender texture. Tabby and I have been both frightened in our return by sea from the coast of Fife, she was afraid of drowning and I of catching cold, in consequence of being drenched with seawater, but my fears as well as hers, have been happily disappointed. She is now in perfect health, I wish I could say the same of Liddy, something uncommon is the matter with that poor girl, her color fades, her appetite, fails, and her spirits flag, she has become moping and melancholy, and is often found in tears, her brother suspects internal uneasiness on account of Wilson and denounces vengeance against that adventurer. She was, it seems, strongly affected at the ball by the sudden appearance of one Mr. Gordon, who strongly resembles the said Wilson, but I am rather suspicious that she caught cold by being, overheated with dancing. I have consulted Dr. Gregory, an eminent physician of an amiable character, who advises the Highland air, and the use of goat milk whey, which, surely, cannot have a bad effect upon a patient who was born and bred among the mountains of Wales, the doctor's opinion is the more agreeable, as we shall find those remedies in the very place which I proposed as the utmost extent of, our expedition, I mean the borders of Argyle. Mr. Smollett, one of the judges of the commissary court, which is now sitting, has very kindly insisted upon our lodging at his country house, on the banks of Loch Lomond about fourteen miles beyond Glasgow. For this last city we shall set out in two days, and take Stirling in our way, well provided with recommendations from our friends at Edinburgh, whom, I protest, I shall leave with much regret. I am so far from thinking it any hardship to live in this country, that, if I was obliged to lead a town life, Edinburgh would certainly be the headquarters of yours always, Matt. Bramble Eden. To Sir Watkin Phillips, Bart. Of Jesus College, Oxon. Dear Knight, I am now little short of the Ualta Thule, if this appellation properly belongs to the Orkneys or Hebrides. These last are now lying before me, to the amount of some hundreds, scattered up and down the Deucalidonian Sea, affording the most picturesque and romantic prospect I ever beheld. I write this letter in a gentleman's house near the town of Inverary which may be deemed the capital of the West Highlands, famous for nothing so much as for the stately castle begun, and actually covered in by the late Duke of Argyle, at a prodigious expense, whether it will ever be completely finished is a question, but, to take things in order, we left Edinburgh ten days ago, and the further north we proceed, we find Mrs. Tabitha the less, manageable, so that her inclinations are not of the nature of the lodestone they point not towards the pole. What made her leave Edinburgh with reluctance at last, if we may believe her own assertions, was a dispute which she left unfinished with Mr. Moffat, touching the eternity of hell torments. That gentleman, as he advanced in years, began to be skeptical on this head, till, at length, 
he, declared open war against the common acceptation of the word eternal. He is now persuaded, that eternal signifies no more than an indefinite number of years, and that the most enormous sinner may be quit for nine millions, nine hundred thousand, nine hundred and ninety-nine years of hellfire, which term or period, as he very well observes, forms but an inconsiderable drop, as it were, in the, ocean of eternity, for this mitigation he contends, as a system agreeable to the ideas of goodness and mercy, which we annex to the Supreme Being, our aunt seemed willing to adopt this doctrine in favor of the wicked, but he hinted that no person whatever was so righteous as to be exempted entirely from punishment in a future state, and that the most pious Christian upon earth might think himself, very happy to get off for a fast of seven or eight thousand years in the midst of fire and brimstone. Mrs. Tabitha revolted at this dogma, which filled her at once with horror and indignation, she had recourse to the opinion of Humphrey Clinker, who roundly declared it was the popish doctrine of purgatory, and quoted scripture in defense of the fire everlasting, prepared for the devil and his, angels, the Reverend Master McCor Kindle and all the theologists and saints of that persuasion were consulted, and some of them had doubts about the matter, which doubts and scruples had begun to infect our aunt, when we took our departure from Edinburgh. We passed through Line Lithgow, where there was an elegant royal palace, which is now gone to decay, as well as the town itself, this too is, pretty much the case with Stirling though it still boasts of a fine old castle in which the kings of Scotland were wont to reside in their minority, but Glasgow is the pride of Scotland, and, indeed, it might very well pass for an elegant and flourishing city in any part of Christendom. There we had the good fortune to be received into the house of Mr. Moore, an eminent surgeon, to whom we were recommended by one of our friends at Edinburgh, and, truly, he could not have done us more essential service Mr. Moore is a merry facetious companion, sensible and shrewd, with a considerable fund of humor, and his wife an agreeable woman, well-bred, kind, and obliging. Kindness, which I take to be the essence of good nature and humanity, is the distinguishing characteristic of the Scotch ladies, in their own country, our landlord showed us everything, and introduced us to all the world at Glasgow, where, through his recommendation, we were complimented with the freedom of the town. Considering the trade and opulence of this place, it cannot but abound with gaiety and diversions. Here is a great number of young fellows that rival the youth of the capital in spirit and expense, and I was, soon convinced, that all the female beauties of Scotland were not assembled at the Hunter's Ball in Edinburgh, the town of Glasgow flourishes in learning as well as in commerce, here is an university with professors in all the different branches of science, liberally endowed, and judiciously chosen, it was vacation time when I passed, so that I could not entirely satisfy my curiosity, but their mode of education is certainly preferable to ours in some respects. The students are not left to the private instruction of tutors, but taught in public schools or classes, each science by its particular professor or regent. My uncle is in raptures with Glasgow, he not only visited all the manufacturers of the place, but made excursions all round to Hamilton, Paisley, Renfrew, and every other place, within a dozen miles, where there was anything remarkable to be seen in art or nature. I believe the exercise, occasioned by those jaunts, was of service to my sister Liddy, whose appetite and spirits begin to revive. Mrs. Tabitha displayed her attractions as usual, and actually believed she had entangled one Mr. McClellan, a rich inkle manufacturer, in her snares, but when matters came to an explanation, it appeared that his attachment was altogether spiritual, founded upon an intercourse of devotion, at the meeting of Mr. John Wesley, who, in the course of his evangelical mission, had come hither in person, at length, we set out for the banks of Loch Lomond, passing through the little borough of Dumbarton, or, as my uncle will have it, Dunbritton, where there is a castle, more curious, than anything of the kind I had ever seen. It is honored with a particular description by the elegant Buchanan, as an arx inexpugnabilis, and, indeed, it must have been impregnable by the ancient manner of besieging. 
It is a rock of considerable extent, rising with a double top, in an angle formed by the confluence of two rivers, the Clyde and the Leven, perpendicular and inaccessible on all sides, except in one place where the entrance is fortified, and there is no rising ground in the neighborhood from whence it could be damaged by any kind of battery. From Dumbarton, the West Highlands appear in the form of huge, dusky mountains, piled one over another, but this prospect is not at all surprising to a native of Glamorgan, we have fixed our headquarters at Cameron, a very neat, country house belonging to Commissary Smollett, where we found every sort of accommodation we could desire, it is situated like a druid's temple, in a grove of oak, close by the side of La Clomond which is a surprising body of pure transparent water, unfathomably deep in many places, six or seven miles broad, four and twenty miles in length, displaying above twenty green islands, covered with, wood, some of them cultivated for corn, and many of them stocked with red deer, they belong to different gentlemen, whose seats are scattered along the banks of the lake, which are agreeably romantic beyond all conception. My uncle and I have left the women at Cameron, as Mrs. Tabitha would by no means trust herself again upon the water, and to come hither it was necessary to cross a small inlet of the sea, in an open ferry boat, this country appears more and more wild and savage the further we advance, and the people are as different from the lowland Scots, in their looks, garb, and language, as the mountaineers of Brecknock are from the inhabitants of Herefordshire. When the lowlanders want to drink a cheer-upping cup, they go to the public house, called the change house, and call for a chopine of two penny, which is a thin, yeasty beverage, made of malt, not quite so strong as the table beer of England. Comma this is brought in a pewter stoop, shaped like a skittle, from whence it is emptied into a quaff, that is, a curious cup made of different pieces of wood, such as box and ebony, cut into little staves joined alternately, and secured with delicate hoops, having two cars or, handles, it holds about a gill, is sometimes tipped round the mouth with silver, and has a plate of the same metal at bottom, with the landlord's cipher engraved. The Highlanders, on the contrary, despise this liquor, and regale themselves with whiskey, a malt spirit, as strong as Geneva, which they swallow in great quantities, without any signs of inebriation. They are used to it from the cradle, and, find it an excellent preservative against the winter cold, which must be extreme on these mountains, I am told that it is given with great success to infants, as a cordial in the confluent smallpox, when the eruption seems to flag, and the symptoms grow unfavorable, the Highlanders are used to eat much more animal food than falls to the share of their neighbors in the low country, they delight in, hunting, have plenty of deer and other game with a great number of sheep, goats, and black cattle running wild, which they scruple not to kill as vention, without being much at pains to ascertain the property. Inverary is but a poor town, though it stands immediately under the protection of the Duke of Argyll, who is a mighty prince in this part of Scotland. The peasants live in wretched cabins, and seem very poor, but the gentlemen are tolerably well lodged, and so loving to strangers that a man runs some risque of his life from their hospitality, it must be observed that the poor Highlanders are now seen to disadvantage. They have been not only disarmed by Act of Parliament, but also deprived of their ancient garb, which was both graceful and convenient, and what is a greater hardship, still, they are compelled to wear breeches, a restraint which they cannot bear with any degree of patience, indeed, the majority wear them, not in the proper place but on poles or long staves over their shoulders, they are even debarred the use of their striped stuff called tartan, which was their own manufacture, prized by them above all the velvets, brocades, and tissues of Europe and Asia, they now lounge along in loose great coats, of coarse russet, equally mean and cumbersome, and betray manifest marks of dejection, certain it is. The government could not have taken a more effectual method to break their national spirit. We have had princely sport in hunting the stag on these mountains. These are the lonely hills of Morven, where Fingal and his heroes enjoyed the same pastime, 
I feel an enthusiastic pleasure when I survey the brown heath that Hashan want to tread, and hear the wind whistle through the bending grass, when I enter our landlord's hall, I look for the suspended harp of that divine bard, and listen in hopes of hearing the aerial sound of his respected spirit, the poems of Hashan are in every mouth, a famous antiquarian of this country, the Laird of Macfarlane, at, whose house we dined a few days ago, can repeat them all in the original Gaelic, which has a great affinity to the Welch, not only in the general sound, but also in a great number of radical words, and I make no doubt that they are both sprung from the same origin. I was not a little surprised, when asking a Highlander one day, if he knew where we should find any game. He replied, who kneel, Sasna, which signifies no English, the very same answer I should have received from a Welchman, and almost in the same words. The Highlanders have no other name for the people of the Low Country, but Sasna, or Saxons, a strong presumption, that the Lowland Scots and the English are derived from the same stock, the peasants of these hills strongly resemble those of Wales in their looks, their manners, and habitations, everything I see, and hear, and feel, seems Welch, the mountains, vales, and streams, the air and climate, the beef, mutton, and game are all Welch, it must be owned, however, that this people are better provided than we in some articles, they have plenty of red deer and roebuck, which are fat and delicious at this season of the year. Their sea teems with amazing, quantities of the finest fish in the world, and they find means to procure very good claret at a very small expense. Our landlord is a man of consequence in this part of the country a cadet from the family of Argyle and hereditary captain of one of his castles, his name, in plain English, is Dougal Campbell, but as there is a great number of the same appellation, they are distinguished, like the, Welch, by patronymics, and as I have known an ancient Briton called Maddock Ap Morgan Ap Jenkin, Ap Jones, our Highland chief designs himself Dull Macomish Maclechian, signifying Dougal, the son of James, the son of Dougal, the son of John. He has travelled in the course of his education, and is disposed to make certain alterations in his domestic economy, but he finds it impossible to abolish the ancient customs of the family, some of which are ludicrous enough his piper for example, who is an hereditary officer of the household, will not part with the least particle of his privileges. He has a right to wear the kilt, or ancient highland dress, with the purse, pistol, and Dirk, a broad yellow ribbon, fixed to the chanter pipe, is thrown over his shoulder, and trails along that ground, while he performs the function of his minstrelsy, and this, I suppose, is analogous to the pennon or flag which was formerly carried before every night in battle. He plays before the laird every Sunday in his way to the kirk, which he circles three times, performing the family march which implies defiance to all the enemies of the clan and every morning he plays a full hour by the clock, in the great hall, marching backwards and forwards all the time, with a solemn pace, attended by the laird's kinsmen, who seem much delighted with the music, in this exercise, he indulges them with a variety of pibrics or airs, suited to the different passions, which he would either excite or assuage. Mr. Campbell himself, who performs very well on the violin, has an invincible antipathy to the sound of the highland bagpipe, which sings in the nose with a most alarming twang, and, indeed, is quite intolerable to ears of common sensibility, when aggravated by the echo of a vaulted hall, he therefore begged the piper would have some mercy upon him, and dispense with this part of the morning service, a consultation of the clan being held on this occasion, it was unanimously agreed, that the laird's request could not be granted without a dangerous encroachment upon the customs of the family, the piper declared, he could not give up for a moment the privilege he derived from his ancestors, nor would the laird's relations forego an entertainment which they valued above all others there was no remedy, Mr. Campbell, being obliged to acquiesce, is fain to stop his ears with cotton, to fortify his head with three or four nightcaps and every morning retire into the penetralia of his habitation, in order to avoid this diurnal annoyance. When the music ceases, 
he produces himself at an open window that looks into the courtyard, which is by this time filled with a crowd of his vassals and dependents, who worship his first appearance, by uncovering their heads, and bowing to the, earth with the most humble prostration. As all these people have something to communicate in the way of proposal, complaint, or petition, they wait patiently till the laird comes forth, and, following him in his walks, are favored each with a short audience in his turn. Two days ago, he dispatched above an hundred different solicitors, in walking with us to the house of a neighboring gentleman, where we dined by invitation. Our landlord's housekeeping is equally rough and hospitable, and savors much of the simplicity of ancient times. The great hall, paved with flat stones, is about forty-five feet by twenty-two, and serves not only for a dining room, but also for a bedchamber, to gentlemen dependents and hangers-on of the family. At night, half a dozen occasional beds are ranged on, each side along the wall. These are made of fresh heath, pulled up by the roots, and disposed in such a manner as to make a very agreeable couch, where they lie, without any other covering than the plaid. My uncle and I were indulged with separate chambers and down beds which we begged to exchange for a layer of heath and indeed I never slept so much to my satisfaction. It was not only soft and, elastic, but the plant, being in flower, diffused an agreeable fragrance, which is wonderfully refreshing and restorative. Yesterday we were invited to the funeral of an old lady, the grandmother of a gentleman in this neighborhood, and found ourselves in the midst of fifty people, who were regaled with a sumptuous feast, accompanied by the music of a dozen pipers. In short, this meeting had all, the air of a grand festival, and the guests did such honor to the entertainment, that many of them could not stand when we were reminded of the business on which we had met. The company forthwith taking horse, rode in a very irregular cavalcade to the place of interment, a church, at the distance of two long miles from the castle. On our arrival, however, we found we had committed a small, oversight, in leaving the corpse behind. So we were obliged to wheel about, and met the old gentlewoman halfway, being carried upon poles by the nearest relations of her family, and attended by the coronach, composed of a multitude of old hags, who tore their hair, beat their breasts, and howled most hideously. At the grave, the orator, or Sinuchi, pronounced the panegyric of the defunct, every, period being confirmed by a yell of the coronach. The body was committed to the earth the pipers playing a pie brock all the time, and all the company standing uncovered. The ceremony was closed with the discharge of pistols, then we returned to the castle, resumed the bottle, and by midnight there was not a sober person in the family, the females excepted. The squire and I were, with some difficulty, permitted to retire with our landlord in the evening, but our entertainer was a little chagrined at our retreat and afterwards seemed to think it a disparagement to his family, that not above a hundred gallons of whiskey had been drunk upon such a solemn occasion. This morning we got up by four, to hunt the roebuck, and, in half an hour, found breakfast ready served in the hall. The, hunters consisted of Sir George Colquhoun and me, as strangers, my uncle not choosing to be of the party, of the laird in person, the laird's brother, the laird's brother's son, the laird's sister's son, the laird's father's brother's son, and all their foster brothers, who are counted parcel of the family, but we were attended by an infinite number of gay alleys, or ragged highlanders without shoes, or stockings. The following articles formed our morning's repast, one kit of boiled eggs, a second, full of butter, a third full of cream, an entire cheese, made of goat's milk, a large earthen pot full of honey, the best part of a ham, a cold venison pasty, a bushel of oatmeal, made in thin cakes and bannocks, with a small wheaten loaf in the middle for the strangers, a large stone bottle full, of whiskey, another of brandy, and a kilderkin of ale. There was a ladle chained to the cream kit, with curious wooden bickers to be filled from this reservoir. The spirits were drank out of a silver quaff, and the ale out of hams. Great justice was done to the collation by the guest in general, one of them in particular ate above two dozen of hard eggs, with a proportionable quantity of bread, butter, and honey, 
nor was one drop of liquor left upon the board. Finally, a large roll of tobacco was presented by way of desert, and every individual took a comfortable quid, to prevent the bad effects of the morning air. We had a fine chase over the mountains, after a roebuck, which we killed, and I got home time enough to drink tea with Mrs. Campbell and our squire. Tomorrow we shall set out, on our return for Cameron, we propose to cross the Frith of Clyde, and take the towns of Greenock and Port Glasgow in our way. This circuit being finished, we shall turn our faces to the south, and follow the sun with augmented velocity, in order to enjoy the rest of the autumn in England, where Boreas is not quite so biting as he begins already to be on the tops of these northern hills. But our progress from place to place, shall continue to be specified in these detached journals of yours always, J. To Dr. Lewis. Dear Dick, about a fortnight is now elapsed, since we left the capital of Scotland, directing our course towards Stirling, where will a. The castle of this place is such another as that of Edinburgh, and affords a surprising prospect of the windings of the river Forth, which are so extraordinary, that the distance from hence to Alloa by land, is but forty miles, and by water it is, twenty-four. Alloa is a neat thriving town that depends in a great measure on the commerce of Glasgow, the merchants of which send hither tobacco and other articles, to be deposited in warehouses for exportation from the Frith of Forth. In our way hither we visited a flourishing iron work, where, instead of burning wood, they use coal, which they have the art of clearing in such a manner as frees, it from the sulphur, that would otherwise render the metal too brittle for working. Excellent coal is found in almost every part of Scotland. The soil of this district produces scarce any other grain but oats, lid barley, perhaps because it is poorly cultivated, and almost altogether unenclosed. The few enclosures they have consist of paltry walls of loose stones gathered from the fields, which, indeed they cover, as if they had been scattered on purpose. When I expressed my surprise that the peasants did not disencumber their grounds of these stones, a gentleman, well acquainted with the theory as well as practice of farming, assured me that the stones, far from being prejudicial, were serviceable to the crop. This philosopher had ordered a field of his own to be cleared, manured and, sown with barley, and the produce was more scanty than before. He caused the stones to be replaced, and next year the crop was as good as ever. The stones were removed a second time, and the harvest failed, they were again brought back, and the ground retrieved its fertility. The same experiment has been tried in different parts of Scotland with the same success, astonished at this information, I, desired to know in what manner he accounted for this strange phenomenon, and he said there were three ways in which the stones might be serviceable. They might possibly restrain an excess in the perspiration of the earth analogous to collocative sweats, by which the human body is sometimes wasted and consumed. They might act as so many fences to protect the tender blade from the piercing winds, of the spring, or, by multiplying the reflection of the sun, they might increase the warmth, so as to mitigate the natural chillness of the soil and climate, but, surely this excessive perspiration might be more effectually checked by different kinds of manure, such as ashes, lime, chalk, or marl, of which last it seems there are many pits in this kingdom, as for the warmth, it would be much more, equally obtained by enclosures, the cultivation would require less labor, and the ploughs, harrows, and horses, would not suffer half the damage which they now sustain. These northwestern parts are by no means fertile in corn. The ground is naturally barren and moorish. The peasants are poorly lodged, meager in their looks mean in their apparel, and remarkably dirty. This last reproach they, might easily wash off, by means of those lakes, rivers, and rivulets of pure water, with which they are so liberally supplied by nature. Agriculture cannot be expected to flourish where the farms are small, the leases short, and the husbandman begins upon a rack rent, without a sufficient stock to answer the purposes of improvement. The granaries of Scotland are the banks of the Tweed, the counties of East and Midlothian, the Cars of Gowrie, 
in Perthshire, equal in fertility to any part of England, and some tracts in Aberdeenshire and Murray, where I am told the harvest is more early than in Northumberland, although they lie above two degrees farther north. I have a strong curiosity to visit many places beyond the Forth and the Tay, such as Perth, Dundee, Montrose, and Aberdeen, which are towns equally elegant and thriving, but the season is too far advanced to admit of this addition to my original plan. I am so far happy as to have seen Glasgow, which, to the best of my recollection and judgment, is one of the prettiest towns in Europe, and, without all doubt, it is one of the most flourishing in Great Britain. In short, it is a perfect beehive in point of industry. It stands partly on a gentle declivity, but the greatest part of it is in a plain, watered by the River Clyde. The streets are straight, open, airy, and well paved, and the houses lofty and well built of hewn stone. At the upper end of the town, there is a venerable cathedral, that may be compared with York Minster or Westminster, and, about the middle of the descent from this to the cross, is the college, a respectable pile of building, with all manner of accommodation for the professors and students, including an elegant library, an observatory well provided with astronomical instruments. The number of inhabitants is said to amount to 30,000, and marks of opulence and independency appear in every quarter of this commercial city, which, however, is not without its inconveniences and defects. The water of their public pumps is generally hard and brackish, an imperfection a loss excusable, as the river Clyde runs by their doors, in the lower part of the town, and there are rivulets and springs above the cathedral, sufficient to fill a large reservoir with excellent water, which might be thence distributed to all the different parts of the city. It is of more consequence to consult the health of the inhabitants in this article than to employ so much attention in beautifying their town with new streets, squares, and churches. Another defect, not so easily remedied, is the shallowness of the river, which will not float vessels of any burthen within ten or twelve miles of the city, so that the merchants are obliged to load and unload their ships at Greenock and Port Glasgow situated about 14 miles nearer the mouth of the Frith, where it is about two miles broad. The people of Glasgow have a noble spirit of enterprise, Mr. Moore, a surgeon, to whom I was recommended from Edinburgh, introduced me to all the principal merchants of the place. Here I became acquainted with Mr. Cochrane, who may be styled one of the sages of this kingdom. He was first magistrate at the time of the last rebellion. I sat as member when he was examined in the House of Commons, upon which occasion Mr. P. observed he had never heard such a sensible evidence given at that bar. I was also introduced to Dr. John Gordon, a patriot of a truly Roman spirit, who is the father of the linen manufacture in this place, and was the great promoter of the city workhouse, infirmary, and other works of public utility. Had he lived in ancient Rome, he would have been honored with a statue at the public expense. I moreover conversed with one Mr. G. S. S. F. D., whom I take to be one of the greatest merchants in Europe. In the last war, he is said to have had at one time five and twenty ships with their cargoes, his own property, and to have traded for above half a million sterling a year. The last war was a fortunate period for the commerce of Glasgow, the merchants considering that their ships bound for America, launching out at once into the Atlantic by the north of Ireland, pursued a track very little frequented by privateers, resolved to insure one another, and saved a very considerable sum by this resolution, as few or none of their ships were taken, you must, know I have a sort of national attachment to this part of Scotland, the great church dedicated to Street Munga, the River Clyde and other particulars that smack of our Welsh language and customs, contribute to flatter me with the notion, that these people are the descendants of the Britons, who once possessed this country. Without all question, this was a Cumbrian kingdom, its capital was Dumbarton, a corruption of Dunbritton, which still exists as a royal borough, at the influx of the Clyde and Leven, ten miles below Glasgow. The same neighbourhood gave birth to St. Patrick, the Apostle of Ireland, at a place where there is still a church and village, which retain his name. 
hard by are some vestiges of the famous Roman wall, built in the reign of Antonine, from the Clyde to the Forth, and, fortified with castles, to restrain the incursions of the Scots or Caledonians, who inhabited the West Highlands. In a line parallel to this wall, the merchants of Glasgow have determined to make a navigable canal betwixt the two firths which will be of incredible advantage to their commerce, in transporting merchandise from one side of the island to the other. From Glasgow we travelled along the Clyde, which is a delightful stream, adorned on both sides with villas, towns, and villages. Here is no want of groves, and meadows, and cornfields interspersed, but on this side of Glasgow, there is little other grain than oats and barley, the first are much better, the last much worse, than those of the same species in England. I wonder, there is so little rye, which is a grain that will thrive, in almost any soil, and it is still more surprising, that the cultivation of potatoes should be so much neglected in the highlands, where the poor people have not meal enough to supply them with bread through the winter. On the other side of the river are the towns of Paisley and Renfrew. The first, from an inconsiderable village, is become one of the most flourishing places of the kingdom. Enriched by the linen, came brick, flowered lawn, and silk manufactures. It was formerly noted for a rich monastery of the monks of Cluny, who wrote the famous Scoti Chronicon, called the Black Book of Paisley. The old abbey still remains, converted into a dwelling house. Belonging to the Earl of Dundonald, Renfrew is a pretty town, on the banks of Clyde, capital of the Shire, which was heretofore the patrimony of the Stuart family, and gave the title of Baron to the King's eldest son, which is still assumed by the Prince of Wales. The Clyde we left a little on our left hand at Dunbarton, where it widens into an estuary or frith, being augmented by the influx of the Leven. On this spot stands the castle formerly called Alclud washed, by these two rivers on all sides, except a narrow isthmus, which at every spring tide is overflowed. The whole is a great curiosity, from the quality and form of the rock, as well as from the nature of its situation, we now crossed the water of Leven, which, though nothing near so considerable as the Clyde, is much more transparent, pastoral, and delightful. This charming stream is the outlet of Loch Lomond and through a tract of four miles pursues its winding course, murmuring over a bed of pebbles, till it joins the frith at Dunbarton. A very little above its source, on the lake, stands the house of Cameron, belonging to Mr. Smollett, so embosomed in an oak wood, that we did not see it till we were within fifty yards of the door. I have seen the Lago di Garda, Albano, Divico, Bolsina, and Geneva, and, upon my honour, I prefer Loch Lomond to them all, a preference which is certainly owing to the verdant islands that seem to float upon its surface, affording the most encanting objects of repose to the excursive view. Nor are the banks destitute of beauties, which even partake of the sublime. On this side they display a sweet variety of, woodland, cornfield, and pasture, with several agreeable villas emerging as it were out of the lake, till, at some distance, the prospect terminates in huge mountains covered with heath, which being in the bloom, affords a very rich covering of purple. Everything here is romantic beyond imagination. This country is justly styled the Arcadia of Scotland, and I don't doubt but it may vie with, Arcadia in everything but climate. I am sure it excels it in verdure, wood, and water. What say you to a natural basin of pure water, near thirty miles long? and in some places seven miles broad, and in many above a hundred fathom deep, having four and twenty habitable islands, some of them stocked with deer, and all of them covered with wood, containing immense quantities of delicious fish, salmon, pike, trout, perch, flounders, eels, and powans, the last a delicate kind of freshwater herring peculiar to this lake, and finally communicating with the sea, by sending off the leaven through which all those species, except the Powan, make their exit and entrance occasionally. Enclosed I send you the copy of a little ode to this river, by Dr. Smollett, who was born on the banks of it, within two miles of the place where I am now writing. It is at least picturesque and accurately descriptive, 
If it has no other merit. There is an idea of truth in an agreeable landscape taken from nature, which pleases me more than the gayest fiction which the most luxuriant fancy can display. I have other remarks to make, but as my paper is full, I must reserve them till the next occasion. I shall only observe at present that I am determined to penetrate at least forty miles into the highlands, which now appear like a vast fantastic vision in the clouds. Inviting the approach of yours always, Matt. Bramble Cameron, August 28th. Ode to Leaven Water on Leaven's Banks, while free to rove, and tune the rural pipe to love, I envied not the happiest swain that ever trod th Arcadian plain. Pure, stream. In whose transparent wave my youthful limbs I want to lave, no torrents stain thy limpid source, no rocks impede thy dimpling course. That sweetly warbles o'er its bed, with white, round, polished pebbles spread, while, lightly poised, the scaly brood in myriads cleave thy crystal flood, the springing trout in speckled pride, the salmon, monarch of the tide, the ruthless pike, intent on, war, the silver eel, and mottled par. Devolving from thy parent lake, a charming maze thy waters make, by bowers of birch, and groves of pine, and hedges flowered with eglantine. Still on thy banks so gaily green, may numerous herds and flocks be seen, and lasses chanting o'er the pale, and shepherds piping in the dale, and ancient faith that knows no guile, and industry embroned with toil, and, hearts resolved, and hands prepared, the blessings they enjoy to guard. The par is a small fish, not unlike the smelt, which it rivals. To Dr. Lewis. Dear Doctor, if I was disposed to be critical, I should say this house of Cameron is too near the lake, which approaches, on one side, to within six or seven yards of the window. It might have been placed in a higher site, which would have afforded a more extensive prospect and a drier atmosphere, but this imperfection is not chargeable on the present proprietor, who purchased it, ready built rather than be at the trouble of repairing his own family house of Bon Hill, which stands two miles from hence on the Leaven, so surrounded with plantation, that it used to be known by the name of the Mavis, or Thrush, Nest. Above that house is a romantic glen or cliff of a mountain, covered with hanging woods having at bottom a stream of fine water that forms a number of cascades in, its descent to join the Leaven, so that the scene is quite enchanting. A captain of a man of war, who had made the circuit of the globe with Mr. Anson, being conducted to this glen, exclaimed, Juan Fernandez, by God! Indeed, this country would be a perfect paradise, if it was not, like Wales, cursed with a weeping climate, owing to the same cause in both, the neighborhood of high mountains, and a, westerly situation, exposed to the vapors of the Atlantic Ocean. This air, however, notwithstanding its humidity, is so healthy, that the natives are scarce ever visited by any other disease than the smallpox, and certain cutaneous evils, which are the effects of dirty living, the great and general reproach of the commonalty of this kingdom. Here are a great many living monuments of longevity, and among the rest a person, whom I treat with singular respect, as a venerable druid, who has lived near ninety years, without pain or sickness, among oaks of his own planting. He was once proprietor of these lands, but being of a projecting spirit, some of his schemes miscarried, and he was obliged to part with his possession, which hath shifted hands two or three times since that period. But, every succeeding proprietor hath done everything in his power, to make his old age easy and comfortable. He has a sufficiency to procure the necessaries of life and he and his old woman reside in a small convenient farmhouse, having a little garden which he cultivates with his own hands. This ancient couple live in great health, peace, and harmony, and, knowing no wants, enjoy the perfection of content. Mr. Smollett calls him the Admiral, because he insists upon steering his pleasure boat upon the lake, and he spends most of his time in ranging through the woods, which he declares he enjoys as much as if they were still his own property, I asked him the other day, if he was never sick, and he answered, yes, he had a slight fever the year before the Union. 
if he was not deaf, I should take much pleasure in his conversation, for he is very intelligent, and his memory is surprisingly retentive, these are the happy effects of temperance, exercise, and good nature, notwithstanding all his innocence, however, he was the cause of great perturbation to my man Clinker, whose natural superstition has been much injured, by the histories of witches, fairies, ghosts, and goblins, which he has, heard in this country, on the evening after our arrival, Humphrey strolled into the wood, in the course of his meditation, and all at once the admiral stood before him, under the shadow of a spreading oak. Though the fellow is far from being timorous in cases that are not supposed preternatural, he could not stand the sight of this apparition, but ran into the kitchen, with his hair standing on end, staring wildly, and deprived of utterance. Mrs. Jenkins, seeing him in this condition, screamed aloud, Lord have mercy upon us, he has seen something. Mrs. Tabitha was alarmed, and the whole house in confusion. When he was recruited with a dram, I desired him to explain the meaning of all this agitation, and, with some reluctance, he owned he had seen a spirit, in the shape of an old man with a, white beard, a black cap, and a plaid nightgown. He was undeceived by the admiral in person, who, coming in at this juncture, appeared to be a creature of real flesh and blood. Do you know how we fare in this Scottish paradise? We make free with our landlord's mutton, which is excellent, his poultry yard, his garden, his dairy, and his cellar, which are all well stored. We have delicious salmon, pike, trout, perch, bar, and sea. At the door, for the taking. The Frith of Clyde, on the other side of the hill, supplies us with mullet, red and grey, cod, mackerel, whiting, and a variety of sea fish, including the finest fresh herrings I ever tasted. We have sweet, juicy beef, and tolerable veal, with delicate bread from the little town of Dunbritton, and plenty of partridge, grows, heathcock, and other game in presents. We have been visited by all the gentlemen in the neighborhood, and they have entertained us at their houses, not barely with hospitality, but with such marks of cordial affection as one would wish to find among near relations, after an absence of many years. I told you, in my last, I had projected an excursion to the Highlands, which project I have now happily, executed, under the auspices of Sir George Colquhoun, a colonel in the Dutch service, who offered himself as our conductor on this occasion. Leaving our women at Cameron, to the care and inspection of Lady H. C., we set out on horseback for Inverary, the county town of Argyle, and dined on the road with the Laird of Macfarlane, the greatest genealogist I ever knew in any country, and perfectly, acquainted with all the antiquities of Scotland. The Duke of Argyle has an old castle in Inverary, where he resides when he is in Scotland, and hard by is the shell of a noble Gothic palace, built by the last Duke, which, when finished, will be a great ornament to this part of the Highlands. As for Inverary, it is a place of very little importance. This country is amazingly wild, especially, towards the mountains, which are heaped upon the backs of one another, making a most stupendous appearance of savage nature, with hardly any signs of cultivation, or even of population. All is sublimity, silence, and solitude. The people live together in glens or bottoms where they are sheltered from the cold and storms of winter, but there is a margin of plain ground spread along the seaside, which is well inhabited and improved by the arts of husbandry, and this I take to be one of the most agreeable tracks of the whole island, the sea not only keeps it warm, and supplies it with fish, but affords one of the most ravishing prospects in the whole world, I mean the appearance of the Hebrides, or western islands to the number of three hundred scattered as far as the eye can reach, in, the most agreeable confusion. As the soil and climate of the highlands are but ill adapted to the cultivation of corn, the people apply themselves chiefly to the breeding and feeding of black cattle, which turn to good account. Those animals run wild all the winter, without any shelter or subsistence, but what they can find among the heath. When the snow lies so deep and hard, that they cannot, penetrate to the roots of the grass, they make a diurnal progress, guided by a sure instinct, to
to the seaside at low water, where they feed on the alga marina, and other plants that grow upon the beach. Perhaps this branch of husbandry, which required very little attendance and labor, is one of the principal causes of that idleness and want of industry, which distinguishes these mountaineers in their own country. When they come forth into the world, they become as diligent and alert as any people upon earth. They are undoubtedly a very distinct species from their fellow subjects of the lowlands, against whom they indulge an ancient spirit of animosity, and this difference is very discernible even among persons of family and education. The lowlanders are generally cool and circumspect, the highlanders fiery and ferocious, but this violence of their passions serves only to inflame the zeal of their devotion to strangers, which is truly enthusiastic. We proceeded about twenty miles beyond Inverary, to the house of a gentleman, a friend of our conductor, where we stayed a few days, and were feasted in such a manner, that I began to dread the consequence to my constitution, notwithstanding the solitude that prevails among these mountains, there is no want of people in the highlands. I am credibly informed that the Duke of Argyle can assemble five thousand men in arms, of his own clan and surname, which is Campbell, and there is besides a tribe of the same appellation, whose chief is the Earl of Bredalbine. The Macdonalds are as numerous, and remarkably warlike, the, Camerons, Maliads, Frasers, Grants, Mackenzies, Mkays, Mfersons, Mintoshes, are powerful clans, so that if all the Highlanders, including the inhabitants of the Isles, were united, they could bring into the field an army of forty thousand fighting men, capable of undertaking the most dangerous enterprise. We have lived to see four thousand of them, without discipline, throw the whole kingdom of Great Britain into confusion. They attacked and defeated two armies of regular troops accustomed to service. They penetrated into the center of England, and afterwards marched back with deliberation in the face of two other armies, through an enemy's country, where every precaution was taken to cut off their retreat. I know not any other people in Europe, who, without the use or knowledge of, arms, will attack regular forces sword in hand, if their chief will head them in battle. When disciplined, they cannot fail of being excellent soldiers. They do not walk like the generality of mankind, but trot and bounce like deer, as if they moved upon springs, they greatly excel the lowlanders in all the exercises that require agility, they are incredibly abstemious, and patient of hunger and fatigue, so steeled against the weather, that in traveling, even when the ground is covered with snow, they never look for a house, or any other shelter but their plaid, in which they wrap themselves up, and go to sleep under the cope of heaven. Such people, in, quality of soldiers, must be invincible when the business is to perform quick marches in a difficult country, to strike sudden strokes, beat up the enemy's quarters, harass their cavalry, and perform expeditions without the formality of magazines, baggage, forage, and artillery. The chieftainship of the Highlanders is a very dangerous influence operating at the extremity of the island, where the, eyes and hands of government cannot be supposed to see, and, act with precision and vigor. In order to break the force of clanship, administration has always practiced the political maxim, divide at impra. The legislature hath not only disarmed these mountaineers, but also deprived them of their ancient garb, which contributed in a great measure to keep up their military spirit, and their, slavish tenures are all dissolved by act of parliament, so that they are at present as free and independent of their chiefs, as the law can make them but the original attachment still remains, and is founded on something prior to the feudal system, about which the writers of this age have made such a pother, as if it was a new discovery, like the Copernican system. Every peculiarity of policy, custom, and even temperament, is effectively traced to this origin, as if the feudal constitution had not been common to almost all the natives of Europe. For my part, I expect to see the use of trunk hose and butter dale ascribed to the influence of the feudal system. The connection between the clans and their chiefs is, without all doubt, patriarchal. It is founded on hereditary regard and, affection, cherished through a long succession of ages. 
The clan consider the chief as their father, they bear his name, they believe themselves descended from his family, and they obey him as their lord, with all the ardor of filial love and veneration, while he, on his part, exerts a paternal authority, commanding, chastising, rewarding, protecting, and maintaining them as his own children. If, the legislature would entirely destroy this connection, it must compel the Highlanders to change their habitation and their names. Even this experiment has been formerly tried without success, in the reign of James via battle was fought within a few short miles of this place, between two clans, the Mgrigors and the Colquhouns, in which the latter were defeated, the Laird of Mgrigor made such a barbarous use of his victory, that he was forfeited and outlawed by Act of Parliament, his lands were given to the family of Montrose, and his clan were obliged to change their name. They obeyed so far, as to call themselves severally Campbell, Graham, or Drummond, the surnames of the families of Argyle, Montrose, and Perth, that they might enjoy the protection of those houses, but they still, added Mgrigor to their new appellation, and as their chief was deprived of his estate, they robbed and plundered for his subsistence. Mr. Cameron of Lochiel, the chief of that clan, whose father was attainted for having been concerned in the last rebellion, returning from France in obedience to a proclamation and act of parliament, passed at the beginning of the late war, paid a visit to his own country, and hired a farm in the neighborhood of his father's house, which had been burnt to the ground. The clan, though ruined and scattered, no sooner heard of his arrival than they flocked to him from all quarters, to welcome his return, and in a few days stocked his farm with seven hundred black cattle, which they had saved in the general wreck of their affairs, but their beloved chief, who, was a promising youth, did not live to enjoy the fruits of their fidelity and attachment. The most effectual method I know to weaken, and at length destroy this influence, is to employ the commonalty in such a manner as to give them a taste of property and independence. In vain the government grants them advantageous leases on the forfeited estates, if they have no property to prosecute the means, of improvement, the sea is an inexhaustible fund of riches, but the fishery cannot be carried on without vessels, casks, salt, lines, nets, and other tackle. I conversed with a sensible man of this country, who, from a real spirit of patriotism had set up a fishery on the coast, and a manufacture of coarse linen, for the employment of the poor Highlanders. Cod is here in such plenty, that he told, me he had seen several hundred taken on one line, at one haul, it must be observed, however, that the line was of immense length, and had two thousand hooks, baited with mussels, but the fish was so superior to the cod caught on the banks of Newfoundland that his correspondent at Lisbon sold them immediately at his own price, although Lent was just over when they arrived, and the people might be, supposed quite cloyed with this kind of diet, his linen manufacture was likewise in a prosperous way, when the late war intervening, all his best hands were pressed into the service. It cannot be expected, that the gentlemen of this country should execute commercial schemes to render their vassals independent, nor, indeed, are such schemes suited to their way of life and inclination, but a company, of merchants might, with proper management, turn to good account a fishery established in this part of Scotland, our people have a strange itch to colonize America, when the uncultivated parts of our own island might be settled to greater advantage. After having rambled through the mountains and glens of Argyle, we visited the adjacent islands of Ela, Jura, Mull, and Icomgill. In the first, we saw, the remains of a castle, built in a lake, where MacDonald, lord or king of the isles, formerly resided. Jura is famous for having given birth to one Macrane, who lived 180 years in one house, and died in the reign of Charles II. Mull affords several bays, where there is safe anchorage, in one of which, the Florida, a ship of the Spanish Armada, was blown up by one of, Mr. Smollett's ancestors, about forty years ago, John Duke of Argyle is said to have consulted the Spanish registers, by which it appeared, that this ship had the military chest on board, he employed experienced divers to examine the wreck, and they found the hull of the vessel still entire, but so covered with sand, 
that they could not make their way between decks, however, they picked up several pieces of plate that were scattered about in the bay, and a couple of fine brass cannon. Icomgil, or Iona, is a small island which Street Columba chose for his habitation, it was respected for its sanctity, and college or seminary of ecclesiastics, part of its church is still standing, with the tombs of several Scottish, Irish, and Danish sovereigns, who were here interred, these islanders are very, bold and dexterous watermen, consequently the better adapted to the fishery, in their manners they are less savage and impetuous than their countrymen on the continent, and they speak the Erse or Gaelic in its greatest purity. Having sent round our horses by land, we embarked in the distinct of Cowl, for Greenock, which is a neat little town, on the other side of the Frith, with a curious, harbour formed by three stone jetties, carried out a good way into the sea, Newport Glasgow is such another place, about two miles higher up. Both have a face of business and plenty, and are supported entirely by the shipping of Glasgow, of which I counted sixty large vessels in these harbours, taking boat again at Newport, we were in less than an hour landed on the other side, within two short, miles of our headquarters, where we found our women in good health and spirits. They had been two days before joined by Mr. Smollett and his lady, to whom we have such obligations as I cannot mention, even to you, without blushing. Tomorrow we shall bid adieu to the Scotch Arcadia, and begin our progress to the southward, taking our way by Lanark and Nithsdale, to the west borders of England. I, have received so much advantage and satisfaction from this tour, that if my health suffers no revolution in the winter, I believe I shall be tempted to undertake another expedition to the northern extremity of Caithness, unencumbered by those impediments which now clog the heels of, yours, Matt.